Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Fixed Interests. I'm Jan Friedrich, Head of Europe, Middle East and Africa Sovereign Ratings at Fitch. I'm joined today by Toby Isles, Fitch's Head of Middle East and Africa Sovereign Ratings, to discuss geopolitical risks in the Middle East and implications for economies and ratings. So, Toby, how have the events of October 7, the Israel-Hamas war and the tension of the Red Sea changed the geopolitical landscape in the MENA region. Thanks, Jan. Well, in the last couple of years, there had been a trend of de-escalation in, in regional politics. There was the end of the blockade of Qatar, greater efforts to stabilize Yemen, the Saudi-Iran detente, and a general trend of greater pragmatism across regional relations. The Abraham Accords agreed on normalization of relations between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE, and there were ongoing talks to expand normalization with Israel to other Arab states. However, the events of October 7th and the ensuing Israel-Gaza war have again increased regional instability. So we see not just the war in Gaza, but blows traded across the Israel-Lebanon border, disruption of Red Sea transit, and other security incidents involving groups linked to Iran and US reprisals for these. So this is impacting widely Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. All this also presents the risk of a widening of the conflict. Importantly, the main actors, including Israel, Hezbollah, Iran, the US and Gulf states though, seem minded to prevent an escalation. There have been a number of incidents that could have sparked such an escalation, but these situations have been contained. So this is helping to limit the probability of a wider war but there still remains the risk of miscalculation. Also, crucially, the question of Palestinian statehood has come firmly back on the agenda, and this is hardly going to be an easy issue to solve. Okay, so could you run us through the economic impact on the sovereigns most affected by these events, and um, could you also talk about the potential implications for actual sovereign ratings? Sure. So... First of all, Israel has experienced the largest negative economic impact. Growth has slowed due to the big dent to domestic demand. The costs of the war have blown out the budget deficit. Israel is able to absorb such near-term hits without too much economic damage. There are still inflows into the pivotal high-tech sector. The economy could bounce back strongly in 2025. However, the ongoing nature of the conflict and its uncertain resolution create the risk of a longer-lasting impact. We placed Israel on rating watch negative shortly after October the 7th to reflect heightened geopolitical risks and their potential impact on the economy and public finances. The resolution of that rating watch negative will depend on whether the impact is material and prolonged, most likely, or whether it is more likely to be temporary. What about Egypt? That's right. The ne next most affected sovereign has been Egypt, um, given the disruptions to Suez Canal traffic and to tourism, both of which generate important streams of FX revenue for the country, and given that Egypt was already experiencing shortages of FX. So the downgrade of Egypt to B- minus stable in early November, this reflected increased risks to Egypt's external financing and, and public finances, and this was mostly due to the obstacles enacting reforms and progressing with the IMF program. That downgrade was not related strongly to spillovers from events in Gaza. We incorporated some hit to tourism and Suez revenues, but it, it wasn't the main driver. And, and now when we look at it now, the impact is actually double-edged. On the one hand, there is added pressure on external finances and greater loss of confidence in the currency. But on the other hand, events seem to have galvanized support for Egypt from international institutions and bilateral partners. So in particular, Egypt and, I and the IMF are close to an agreement. Uh, the UAE, via one of its sovereign wealth funds, ADQ, has agreed a major investment with upfront payments of $24 billion and fresh money to Egypt. This is likely to pave the way for the long-awaited currency adjustment, which now looks like it will be less violent than feared. The parallel rate had widened to 70 versus the official rate of 30, but this has now come in dipping below 50 in recent days and could converge further. A weaker rate, somewhere around 45, would still allow for a trend down in inflation in the second half of the year, limiting the extent to which authorities will need to hike interest rates to support the exchange rate adjustment. Of course, where the currency 
trends after that will depend on FX supply um, from many factors. These developments still leave Egypt facing a significant public finances challenge, which will take time to address debts over 90% of GDP, interest costs consume at least 50% of revenue, an extremely high level across the sovereign universe. And of course, per our discussion today, the ongoing nature of the conflict in Gaza still presents important risks. Nonetheless, less stress on foreign liquidity provides some much needed breathing room and would support our stable outlook. Elsewhere, and um, worth mentioning, Jordan's proximity to the conflict, demographic composition and the importance of tourism to the economy highlight that country's vulnerability to spillovers. However, the strength of international support for Jordan, including financial support from multilateral and bilateral partners, combined with the country's robust level of foreign reserves and track record of resilience to external shocks, provides some comfort in the near term. We affirmed Jordan's rating at double B minus stable in early November. And finally, it is worth noting that Iraq has seen a number of security incidents, including attacks by Shia militias on US assets and reprisals from the US military. Nonetheless, a significant level of geopolitical and security risk is already incorporated into that B minus rating for Iraq. And Lebanon is, is clearly impacted, but the country remains in default. How about the impact on the GCC sovereigns? In what scenario could the war and the broader tensions lead to actual effects on the sovereign ratings in the GCC? So far, GCC economies have not been materially affected by the war and its spillovers. At the margins, the disruption to shipping has caused some delays, some higher costs, and, and the perception of greater risk can be negative in itself, but the impact has been contained so far. The scenario in which there could be more to worry about for the GCC involves a, a significant widening of the war. For example, such that Hezbollah and Israel enter into full-blown conflict. Iran and the US are drawn more directly in to events with the GCC states perceived to be aligned with the US. If this sort of scenario caused attacks against GCC energy infrastructure and shipping, including through the Straits of Hormuz, this could be credit negative. It would depend on its severity and durability though. Temporary disruption would likely be manageable, given that many GCC states have substantial liquid assets. And of course, in such a scenario, oil prices would spike higher, providing support to finances, provided that volumes can still be sold. So for this to be credit negative, the scenario, there needs to be, there needs to be this durability to it. And as, we, as we've mentioned so far, the main actors currently seem minded to contain the conflict, limiting the probability of such an outcome for the GCC as things stand. Thank you very much, Toby, for sharing your views on geopolitics in the Middle East. And thanks for those tuning in for this Fixed Interests podcast for listening. To learn more about Fitch Ratings and our credit views, please visit fitchratings.com.